the Megalodon, the big boss of our ancient oceans, the king of all sharks, killer of whales. If you're a fan, you've already witnessed our Megalodon vs. Mosasaur episode, but how would it fare against this mythical sea creature? Who would make the first move? How fast would the Megalodon be? And what tricks would the Kraken have up its sleeve? This is What If, and here's what would happen if a Megalodon shark fought the Kraken. You know, because of climate change, some of the creatures we're talking about in this episode might go extinct. 2023 was the hottest year on record, and emissions from fossil fuels have hit a new high. Look, I know it's easy to get down about a lot of this, but there is some good news when it comes to the environment. Like, we've made significant progress with heat pumps, solar panels, and electric vehicles. They're on track to make up 15.5% of all vehicle sales this year. And the batteries that power them are getting better, cheaper, and more accessible. Incentives to help combat climate change are continuing to develop, and so are the rules around pollution. The most vulnerable nations around the world are getting support to adapt to climate change. Look, at the end of the day, this is a challenge that we can meet, if we all rise to it, and keep the discussion going. According to legend, the Kraken was so large that its body could be mistaken for an island. Yeah, it lured ships with the promise of a safe landing, and then snap, its mouth would close around the unfortunate prey, swallowing the ship whole. But ancient sailors aren't exactly a reliable source of information, so we're going to mix legend with fact and model our kraken on squids and octopuses. Besides, the Kraken wouldn't have to be as large as an island to be a worthy opponent. Okay, we're off the coast of Norway, where the Krakens and the Megalodon's territories overlap. In one corner, we have the Megalodon. This beast comes in at over 18 meters long, three times the size of the largest great white shark, and it's twice as fast as a great white with a maximum speed of over 5 meters a second. The Megalodon's main weapon is its rows of enormous teeth. Its favorite pastime is snacking on whales, dolphins, and seals. And in the other corner, we have the Kraken. This monster is even larger, at 39 meters long three times the size of the largest giant squid. The underside of its long tentacles are covered in suction cups and capped with rotating hooks. Instead of teeth, the kraken has a beak on its underside that can pierce the hardest of shells. Its favorite pastime is sinking ships by creating giant whirlpools. Now you must decide. Whose team would you be on? Okay, it's night the prime hunting time for both of these ocean beasts. The Megalodon would have the initial advantage, sensing the vibrations of a giant beast up ahead. Stealthily, it would stalk the Kraken. It would circle its prey at a distance, sizing up this formidable foe. And then it would strike. The Megalodon would swim full speed at the Kraken, ramming into it and sinking its teeth into the Kraken's delicate skin. And it's quite a chomp. The largest megalodon tooth is 17.8 centimeters long. And it's not just its bite that would be bad. The kraken, weighing around three tons, would be no match for the 50 tons of shark that just collided with it at high speed. But the megalodon wouldn't be able to finish off the kraken with just one bite, so it would release the kraken and circle again preparing for its next strike. But the Kraken would save one trick for the epic finale. It would vomit its digested food, muddying the surrounding water and attracting other fish. All the different smells and vibrations would disorient the Megalodon. And what the Kraken lacks in weight, it makes up for in strength. 
Like an octopus, 90% of its body is pure muscle. It would whip its tentacles around, catching hold of the megalodon with its wicked hooks. The megalodon would struggle, using its body weight to try and escape the kraken, but the kraken is too strong and its grip would be unshakable as its suction cups cling on to the megalodon. The megalodon could bite into one of the kraken's tentacles, tearing it apart, but that wouldn't be enough. The kraken would continue to wrap up the megalodon, bringing the shark to its mouth. With its giant beak, it would bite into the monster shark. One or maybe two bites and the megalodon would be defeated. The kraken would then take its tasty meal deep into the depths below. Could a monster be lurking in our oceans? And no, we're not talking about the Loch Ness Monster or the Megalodon. We're talking about a creature you've probably never heard of. The Mosasaur. But what's a Mosasaur? Could the Mosasaur have survived the Great Extinction? And if it did, how would it change our oceans? This is What If. And here's what would happen if Mosasaurus were still alive. In 2014, a British tourist spotted a strange creature while on a cruise ship in the Gulf of Mexico. It became known as the Carnival Cruise Monster. And the description sounded a lot like a long extinct apex predator, the Mosasaur. But if the Mosasaur had survived the extinction event which killed off three quarters of the plant and animal species on Earth, then we definitely know about it. It would have completely changed what our oceans look like and how we use them. In fact, if the Mosasaur was still roaming our oceans, the Megalodon might never have existed. But how can one animal have such a huge impact? These nightmarish marine animals were actually giant lizards, kind of like the land-dwelling Komodo dragons, but they evolved for life in the ocean. Their anatomy made them dangerous predators. Imagine a lizard monster with the double-hinged jaw of a snake, massive teeth, and a tail like a shark. Oh, and they could be as large as 18 meters long. That's four meters longer than your average yellow school bus. They basically ate anything they wanted. No fish, dolphins, sharks, whales, or even other mosasaurs were safe. Fossils from this species have been found on every continent, including Antarctica. Evidence that these lizard kings dominated the oceans in the Cretaceous period. But they weren't all so ferocious with some species being as small as one meter long. Then how did they become so terrifying? Their ancestors were more like the marine iguanas living on the Galapagos Islands today. Around 90 million years ago, these lizards would have ventured into the ocean for food. At first, they stayed close to the shoreline, but as they evolved, they started to make the open ocean their home. The evolution of their powerful tail vertebrae made them skilled and speedy swimmers, helping them move further away from the shore. But they also remained close to the surface because, like dolphins and whales, they needed to come up for air. It only took 27 million years for the Mosasaur of Jurassic Park to evolve. Of course, the Mosasaur in this movie is not very accurate. Even though a real mosasaur was smaller than the one in Jurassic Park, it was still a very dangerous creature. If this species were alive today, it would completely alter our oceans. But why would it change them? And how would it affect the way we use our oceans? Much of the marine life we know today probably wouldn't exist with the mosasaur inhabiting our seas. They just wouldn't have stood a chance against this mighty foe. Instead, the fish and mammals in our oceans would look and act much differently than they do today. They would have adapted special traits and methods to avoid the Mosasaurus. One ecological theory is that predators actually drive evolution. 
because they force prey to adapt, and quickly. In fact, a 2007 study found that the diversity of marine creatures over the past hundreds of millions of years is directly tied to interactions between predator and prey. So, our oceans might actually be even more diverse if the Mosasaurus still existed. But what about us? Well, this giant lizard would make the oceans a much more dangerous place for humans. We would need much larger boats. Small fishing boats and sailboats could be swallowed whole by this creature. Ocean hobbies like sailing and fishing wouldn't be as popular, and swimming and surfing would certainly be life-threatening. And maybe the story of Moby Dick would be about a menacing mosasaur instead of a whale. Thankfully, mosasaurs do not exist today, or our oceans would look completely different, and that's a good thing. Don't be fooled by these gentle waves. These still waters hide a 20 million year death match between two prehistoric monsters. Grab some popcorn and a snorkel, you have a front row seat for the ultimate aquatic showdown between the megalodon shark and the leviathan whale. Which would have the bigger bite? How big could a megalodon grow? And how fast could a leviathan whale swim? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the megalodon shark fought the leviathan whale. 20 million years ago, these creatures dominated the oceans, and they may have fought before that. Although they're long gone, you can still see the remains of these giants in their descendants. Just look at the sperm whale, which descended from its toothed ancestor. Even this monster doesn't compare in size to the leviathan. And while you might think that the great white descended from the megalodon, it's closer to the blue shark. See that snubbed nose and flat jaw? But if we could see these two giants face off now, who would win? Okay, before we get to the main event, let's run down the stats on these fighters. The Leviathan Whale grew to almost 18 and a half meters in length in its heyday, while today's sperm whale relies on suction to lure its prey. This monster had teeth the size of bowling pins to rip its meals apart. Its massive mouth had the largest tetrapod bite recorded, and it fed on other whales. But these teeth were not this killer's only weapon. Some scientists theorize that the sperm whale uses its unique organ, the spermaceta, to control its buoyancy during deep dives. The waxy substance inside hardens and lets the whale sink into the water easier by filling this body part with cold water. But since the leviathan didn't hunt deep sea creatures, researchers think that this organ could have been used as a battering ram to hammer prey into submission. Scientists also wonder if this organ could have increased the whale's echolocation ability. That means a leviathan could have stunned its target with a sonic blast. But how would the megalodon handle this powerhouse? Well, don't count out this predator yet. Tests have dated megalodon shark fossils back two and a half million years. And the largest bones found were almost 18 meters long, making this the largest fish to ever roam the seas. This shark had one of the most powerful bite forces of any predator on Earth. And with 276 serrated teeth that measured almost 18 centimeters long, this terror has earned its fearsome reputation. Like the leviathans, 
Megalodons fed on large whales, sharks, and dolphins. These gigantic creatures were so fierce that some theories state their babies would devour each other alive while still developing in their mothers. But you didn't come here for Baby Shark. Let's get to the main event. Weighing in at almost 60 tons, the Megalodon would outweigh the Leviathan. The shark might have seen the whale first while on patrol, giving it ample opportunity to attack first. While the whale comes in at only 45 tons, this killing machine is much more intelligent than its opponent and could try different tactics. If the Leviathan had used its agile swimming maneuvers to get at just the right angle, its sonic boom could stun the Megalodon. Then, the whale could ram the massive shark with its head. But this warm-blooded mammal couldn't stay underwater forever. It had to come up for air. That could give the Megalodon the opportunity to chase its deadly prey. Speeding along at 17 meters per second, this ancient shark could have cut through the water fast and landed a bite on the Leviathan's fin, making the whale all but helpless. If the Meg caught a hold of the fin, it could tear through the whale like a steel trap. Remember, this predator relied only on instinct and sheer power. And unlike the Leviathan, it did not back down. But if the whale managed to bite the shark's soft underbelly, it could have a chance of tearing apart its spine. With a bite superior to the Megalodon's, a few strategic whale chomps would end this fight once and for all. While most people online give this fight to the Megalodon shark, the Leviathan whale has the speed and wits to come out on top. What about you? Who do you think would win this battle? Let us know in the comments. You are in the deepest part of our oceans, the Mariana Trench. Suddenly, your sub experiences an earthquake, and when you look outside, you see the terrifying source of it. There's no mistaking the 15 centimeter teeth of the largest apex predator, the Megalodon. Getting bitten by this beast would feel like being crushed by three African elephants stacked on top of each other. What could this apex predator be hunting in the deep? How could it withstand the immense pressure? And how would the Mariana Trench make this apex predator more docile? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the Megalodon was hiding in the Mariana Trench. You know, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our oceans. And with only 15% of our oceans explored, who's to say no ancient predators are hiding somewhere deep underwater? The deepest part of the Mariana Trench, Challenger Deep, stretches 10,984 meters down. You could submerge Mount Everest into it and still have two kilometers to spare. Yeah, that sounds like plenty of parking space for a megalodon or two. But the Mariana Trench is a mysterious, cold, and unforgiving world, steeped in total darkness. The temperature hovers around two degrees Celsius all year round. At its worst, the pressure is 1,000 times stronger than at sea level. So, what if the largest apex predator never went extinct like we thought it did? What if it adapted to this hostile environment, waiting for you to come by for its dinner? Two million years ago, the Megalodon was tearing into the equivalent of 
one and a half cows a day. But this diet plan wouldn't work for this ancient, warm water dwelling apex predator. Because sunlight doesn't reach the depth of the Mariana Trench, there isn't any photosynthesis, and no photosynthesis means not much food. Animals of the deep sea often live by scavenging on the decaying remains of plants and animals from the upper zones of the ocean. Larger animals sometimes store food in expandable stomachs for months. Others cope by being very small and needing less food to survive. So if our megalodon was close to its prehistoric size, it would probably be a few thousand years old. And it could have the Portuguese dogfish and the Greenland shark on the menu. The megalodon would swim to the upper reaches of the ocean and feed at night, then return to the deep during the day. With a bit of luck, our hungry megalodon could even catch some juicy giant squid. So, What's stopping it from chomping into your puny 10,700 kilogram submarine? Well, its teeth and bones might not be in great shape. That's because with the intense pressure of the Mariana Trench, proteins and calcium start to dissolve and disintegrate. The Hadal snailfish, the deepest dwelling fish we know, has flexible cartilage instead of bones. All deep sea creatures also have molecules called pyzolites. Their job is to stop the other molecules from being crushed by the pressure. The Mariana Trench Megalodon would most definitely need to stock up on some of those. To maintain its body temperature, our Megalodon would have to be warm-blooded, and to navigate in total darkness? It would have to either become bioluminescent or grow massive eyes like the giant squid. Its skin could evolve to enable more tactile ways of feeling its way around, an expandable stomach could help it store food, and inward-facing teeth could prevent slimy prey from escaping. But with so many custom fittings and edits to its genetic structure, would it still be the terrifying megalodon we know? Most likely not. Want to learn how to survive a tsunami, grenade blast, or even falling out of a plane? Well, we have a new channel called How to Survive. Check out the link at the end of this video. Millions of years ago, the megalodon shark was one of the scariest creatures to ever lurk in our seas. And even before that, the Mosasaurus reigned supreme, terrorizing every ocean creature in sight. Both these creatures were the apex predators in their separate eras, but what would happen if they had lived during the same time and fought? How would this battle play out? Which creature would have the most advantages? And who would win? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the Megalodon Shark fought the Mosasaur. Before we begin our main event, let's look at the tail of the tape. Weighing in at 60 tons, you have the Megalodon. This giant shark is 25 meters in length and swims up to 17 meters per second. Watch out for its bite, as it has a force of 278,000 kilopascals. The Mosasaur is disadvantaged in almost every aspect. It's shorter by 5 meters, it's about one quarter of the Megalodon's weight, and it has only about half of the bite power of the Megalodon's mighty jaws. But will the Mosasaur be able to make up for it with its increased maneuverability? Let's find out. Fight! The Megalodon begins by hunting for its prey. Since it never had any foes, it will be the initial aggressor in this battle. The Megalodon's hunting style relies on sneaking up beneath its prey and quickly attacking. The shark spots the Mosasaur near the top of the water since that's where it mostly hunts its prey. 
The Mosasaur, as a reptile, also comes up for air every hour. The Megalodon approaches the Mosasaur, but as it begins to open its mouth, the Mosasaur is able to dodge it. This is because, unlike the Megalodon, the Mosasaur has defensive traits. Although it was the apex predator in its time, Mosasaurs would also hunt each other. This means the Mosasaur knows how to fight. And with that skill, it's just able to narrowly dodge the Megalodon's initial attack. Right now, the Megalodon is confused. After all, it never had to win any sort of battle, unlike the Mosasaur. This is a rude awakening for the shark. As the Megalodon is confused, the Mosasaur is able to sneak away quickly. Using its defensive traits, the Mosasaur uses this time to find some cover in hopes of getting the upper hand on the Megalodon. The Mosasaur's forward-facing eyes make it easy to spot the Megalodon. This means the Mosasaur has binocular vision like a bird. As the Mosasaur stays in hiding, it waits for the Megalodon to get close enough. Finally, it strikes. Since the Megalodon's body is far too big for the Mosasaur to bite, the Mosasaur attacks one of the Megalodon's fins. And despite the Megalodon being such a massive, intimidating creature, the Mosasaur is able to chew through it quite easily. That's because the Megalodon is made out of soft tissue and cartilage. The only hard part of its body is its teeth. As the Mosasaur bites into the shark's fin, the Mosasaur might expect the Megalodon to either retreat or die. But since the Megalodon shark is so massive, it won't give up just yet. With the Mosasaur chopping on its fin, the Megalodon knows where the reptile is. At this point, the Mosasaur is trying to swim away and it can swim as fast as it wants to, but despite being injured, the Megalodon is faster and will be able to catch the Mosasaur. The Megalodon opens its mouth and quickly chomps down on the Mosasaur and oh, the Mosasaur is down for the count. One, two, three, and the new champion of the seas is the Megalodon. Unfortunately, the Megalodon won't be able to comment for a post-fight interview. That's because this win wasn't without consequences. The Megalodon took quite a beating, more than it's ever experienced before. Depending on how bad the bite is, the shark may bleed out. But if it manages to survive, it will continue on being the one true apex predator of the ocean. Did you know that there are black holes in the ocean? Yeah, also known as eddies, these black holes are similar to the ones we see in space. They're essentially whirlpools that are so powerful, nothing can escape their pull. What makes them even scarier is their size. They are massive. Some measure up to 150 kilometers in diameter. They're created through a mix of water at different temperatures, wind, and the Earth's rotation. And once they're created, they can last for months or years. Yeah, though it may not seem like it, the ocean is a much more terrifying place than the cosmos. From hideous, alien-like creatures to the mysteries that lie below the sea, these are just some of the reasons why the ocean is scarier than space. We've yet to discover alien life, but looking at some of these creatures, you might think otherwise. Unlike our solar system, the ocean is full of terrifying wildlife. From creatures as simple as sharks and killer whales to the more disturbing looking red octopuses and proboscis worms. Regardless of their appearance, many of them are dangerous and won't be afraid to pick a fight. Earth's ocean might be more mysterious than parts of space. For one, we don't really know what the bottom of our oceans are like, and we might just know more about the surface of Mars and the Moon, but NASA is looking to change that. They're slowly mapping out the ocean floor. This might give us clues about what oceans are like on other planets. It also helps NASA test gear that will be used in space missions. Outer space and our ocean are more similar than we think. Both have high pressures, a lack of breathable air, and extreme temperatures. But what makes the ocean scarier? It's teeming with life that can attack and kill you. Yeah, 
space is passively trying to kill you, while the ocean is actively trying to kill you. Huge destructive asteroids or meteors heading toward Earth are incredibly rare, but you know what isn't? The ocean coming for us. Climate change is causing sea levels to rise at an alarming rate, and if the trend continues, our sea levels could rise over two meters by the year 2100. Coastal communities like Venice, Bangkok, and New York City would face severe floods, causing parts of these cities to be displaced. Light works differently in both space and the ocean. In space, without an atmosphere, the light is harsh and unfiltered. This leads to problems like radiation exposure. Luckily, with our advanced space technology, we found a lot of ways to overcome this. In the deep ocean, there's a lack of light. Depending on how deep you go, it can be so dark that you're unable to see anything. The only thing you can see are the terrifying creatures that have evolved to adapt to this unique environment. Their evolutions have made them frightening looking and potentially dangerous. Space has some scary things that can come for us, like solar flares, giant explosions from the sun that shoot light, energy, and high-speed particles out into space. One massive solar flare hitting Earth could disable all our electronics, sending us back to the Stone Age. Yeah, the chances of one hitting us are incredibly rare, though. Most of the time, they just bounce off our ozone layer. But you know what isn't so rare? Hurricanes. These powerful weather events form over the ocean. If they end up reaching land, they can bring extremely high winds and heavy rainfalls, which can leave entire towns flooded, even decimated. And they're not the only devastating events that come from the ocean. Tsunamis are much more terrifying. These massive waves can reach over 30 meters high, and once they reach land, they're incredibly dangerous. They can cause severe floods and destroy anything on the coast. The Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 killed 225,000 people. No one's ever got lost in space. With an entire support team watching over you using billions of dollars worth of technology and GPS systems, you can rest easy knowing you're in good hands. But in the ocean, people get lost all the time. Just swimming out a little bit farther than you usually would while at the beach can leave you stranded, unable to find land. The ocean has over three million shipwrecks in it, making it one of the most dangerous places on Earth. You don't have to worry about random weather attacks in space. In the ocean, it's a different story. Lightning can strike the ocean at any time. It happens often due to its sheer size and it being a magnet for lightning. When lightning strikes, it can spread for up to 100 meters, and this poses a threat to boats, swimmers, and sea life. The ocean is full of dangerous bacteria. One of the worst is the flesh-eating bacteria that's found in the warm parts of the Gulf of Mexico. The bacteria can get into swimmers' open wounds and cause ulcers on the skin. Antibiotics should be able to solve this issue, but it can sometimes get so bad you need to amputate a limb. Yeah. Space doesn't have anything as scary as that. Up in space, there's a ton of debris known as space junk. And while there's some concern about the debris making space travel dangerous, it's not nearly as concerning as all the garbage we have swimming around in the ocean. In the North Pacific Ocean, there's a massive island of waste known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's made up of mostly plastics, making it almost impossible to break down. As a result, it's harming ocean wildlife and could destroy entire ecosystems. Up in space, the debris is monitored closely by space agencies. They're constantly looking at ways to mitigate the issue, but down in the ocean, the problem keeps getting worse and it'll take a long time before it gets any better. So although the vast unknowns of space are pretty terrifying, they don't come anywhere near to how scary our oceans can be. Hey, Have you ever wondered what dinosaurs were afraid of? What creature in the Cretaceous period made taking a drink of water a dangerous gamble?
I'm talking about terror crocs. No, 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 not, not those crocs. Dino Sucus, otherwise known as the Terror Crocodile. What made terror crocs such extreme predators? If they were still around, what would threaten their survival today? And were they able to eat dinosaurs, bones and all? This is What If, and here's what would happen if terror crocs were still alive. About 80 to 73 million years ago, Dinosuchus ruled over the marshes and swamps and feasted on unsuspecting dinosaurs. Fossils have been found showing that terror crocs grew up to 10 meters long, and they likely weighed close to five tons just about the size of a city bus. They had banana-sized teeth and jaws powerful enough to crush bones. Many terror croc fossils have damaged teeth, leading paleontologists to believe that terror crocs chomped on dinosaur bones. But scientists aren't exactly sure if terror crocs were hunters or scavengers. So if they happened to roam around today, would they hunt us? This might surprise you, but crocodile attacks are actually more common than shark attacks. And they happen around the world. For many people, the risk of being attacked by a crocodile is a daily concern. In fact, thousands of years of crocodile attacks have contributed to our evolutionary fear of reptiles known as herpetophobia. Like our fear of spiders, we've developed this phobia over time. It's a natural way that we protect ourselves. Like modern crocodiles, the Dinosuchus was more of an opportunistic predator. If anything happened to come into its territory, these giant crocs would gobble it up. No questions asked. Most crocodiles eat on average 50 meals a year. As ectotherms, they gather heat from their environment, so they don't need to eat as much as some animals to stay warm. The Nile crocodile can eat up to half its body weight in one meal. If the terror croc ate this much, it could eat about 2,000 kilograms in a day. That's about 36 average-sized humans for breakfast. Crocodiles have a unique valve in their heart. It increases blood flow to their stomachs through a special aorta. This allows them to secrete gastric acid 10 times faster than most animals. This means that they can dissolve entire animals, bones and all. As terrifying as it would be to see one of these giants walking down the street, it's more likely that they would stick to their natural habitat of marshes, rivers and swamps. So you would need to be extra careful about where you go fishing. Even though terror crocs could wreak havoc on our marshland habitats, we'd still hunt them for their skins and make luxury accessories like handbags, shoes and belts. Many crocodiles in Africa and parts of Asia are also killed for their meat. Unfortunately, the bigger an animal is, the more attractive it is to trophy hunters. But with conservation efforts around the world, many endangered species of crocodile have managed to survive. The most deadly predator of the sea spent its day conquering and terrorizing every creature in sight. This is the Megalodon. It lived millions of years ago, but let's assume this monster shark was alive today. And instead of worrying about other creatures in the sea, this Megalodon is now coming for you. How would the Megalodon hunt you down? How could your size be your best advantage? And how could you survive this attack? This is What If, and here's what would happen if you were attacked by a Megalodon. Megalodons are a force to be reckoned with. 
Estimates show that they grew up to 18 meters long. This is three times longer than the largest great white shark ever recorded. Not to mention that their jaw could open up to three and a half meters wide. So, do you think you stand a chance with this beast? Well, let's find out. If you happen to find yourself swimming in the ocean and a megalodon is lurking about, you might actually be okay. There's a chance that since you're so small compared to its other prey, the megalodon wouldn't think you're worth eating. They'd instead go for the blue whale or a pack of great white sharks for some real meat. But just because you're a puny human doesn't mean you'd be safe from the megalodon. After all, the megalodon was so huge and needed so much energy that it would take any morsel of food it could get. It's estimated that the megalodon ate nearly 1,200 kilograms of food every day. But instead of having you swim in the middle of the ocean, let's give you a chance by putting you on a boat. And even with this newly added equipment, you'd still run into some issues. Being on a boat would be much faster, but now you'd be much easier to spot. And the megalodon could now use its signature move. It hunted the majority of its prey by using sneak attacks from below. And now, with you on your boat, it would naturally be doing the same thing to you. With its 34 metric ton body, it would ram your boat from underneath, flipping and destroying it. With your boat completely wrecked, you'd be in the water with the megalodon now hungry for your blood. And speaking of which, if you happen to get a cut during this process, the megalodon would be able to spot you with its keen sense of smell. Just like sharks, when a megalodon smells blood, it aims to kill. No amount of people, noise, or anything else threatening the megalodon would be able to stop its thirst for blood. <laughs> At this point, your best bet would be to remain calm and start swimming to shore or another boat. This is another opportunity where your small size can be used to your advantage. Depending on which ocean you're in, you could hide between coral reefs where the megalodon would be unable to reach you. And if you made it to shallow waters, then your chances of survival would be even better. Since the megalodon was so massive, it wouldn't be able to maneuver around the shallow waters eventually forcing it to lose interest in you and retreat. But realistically, if you were anywhere near this massive beast, you'd quickly become its food. I mean, come on, it's the Megalodon. This thing was one of the deadliest predators of all time. It's the matchup you've been waiting for. The clash between some of the biggest titans that ever roamed the Earth. Today, we're going back in time to see two terrifying predators. From the jungle marsh to the deep ocean, you can expect a megalodon titanoboa fight to be an epic brawl that will go down in history. How could this mega snake overpower the mega shark? What superpower would give the shark an advantage? And which animal would tower over the other? This is What If, and here's what would happen if a megalodon fought a titanoboa. Okay, before the carnage begins, let's break down the stats on these fighters. The Megalodon is one of the largest predators that ever lived. These sharks hunted in the oceans 20 million years ago, but they went extinct 3.6 million years ago. Growing to a length of 18 meters, these beasts measured three times longer than the largest great white shark ever recorded. And check out this massive jaw, spanning three meters wide, with 276 teeth inside. That 
jaw is strong enough to crush a car. But will this killer meet its match against the fearsome Titanoboa? In this corner lies a prehistoric snake that could haunt your dreams, the Titanoboa. This serpent lived during the Paleocene epoch, which ended 56 million years ago. After the dinosaurs went extinct, Titanoboa became the top predator, slithering around on land. Measuring an average of 13 meters and weighing about one and a quarter tons, this snake could roam unchallenged. It dominated its terrain, but a new challenger has entered. While this snake was known to devour giant turtles, fish, and reptiles, the megalodon might just take a bite out of the titanoboa. So let's get down to the main event, the only reason you clicked play. This prehistoric grudge match has been millions of years in the making. But where could these giants duke it out? They both thrived in warmer climates, but the megalodon lives in the ocean and Titanoboa slides through the jungles. You'd have to lure the shark into mangroves or an estuary where the fresh water meets the sea. The megalodon's amazing sense of smell might detect the giant snake first, or it could use its incredible superpower. Some sharks have electroreceptors that detect electrical fields, the energy that their prey generates. This ability could allow the meg to strike first. But this serpentine predator has a few tricks of its own. Titanoboa stalked its prey by hiding in water or between trees and waiting for the perfect moment to strike, which might take days. If the megalodon swims right under the snake, the titanoboa could attack before the shark knows what hit it. If the snake dives into the water, it could sink its curved teeth into the shark. And as the megalodon thrashes around, those meat hooks would dig deeper and deeper into the shark's flesh. The serpent would coil itself tightly around its prey and squeeze hard, trying to choke the life out of the megalodon. With over 276 kilopascals of pressure, the titanoboa could really put the squeeze on the megalodon. But sharks don't have lungs. They have gills that absorb oxygen from the water. And while that massive snake's jaw opens 1.8 meters wide, it's not enough to swallow this aquatic beast whole. Titanoboa needs to crush the megalodon and collapse its organs or block its gill openings. If the snake can drag the shark into shallow water, this fight is over. But in deeper waters, the megalodon could use a high-speed assault and attack from underneath. The furious shark would use its jaws of death to maim and disable the snake, violently shaking the titanoboa's body. In moments, those razor-sharp teeth would split the snake in two. The battle between these two titans would depend on which contender finds its opponent first. It would be a test of patience and savage strength between giants who are anything but sluggish or slow. But since these monsters didn't live at the same time, well, we'll never know for sure how this match would have gone down. If you traveled 250 million years into the past, you'd be witnessing the dawn of dinosaurs. One of the leading theories is that dinosaurs evolved from a species known as archosaurs. These were the dominant reptiles that appeared during the late Permian period. To some, they may even look like dinosaurs, and that's because they were ancestors to these incredible creatures. Over time, the archosaurs split up into two groups. One of these groups led to crocodiles, and the other led to dinosaurs which continued evolving into thousands of different species. 
One of the main traits they eventually gained was their bipedal abilities. Early dinosaurs began to walk on two legs, freeing their front limbs for other uses, like grabbing food and defending themselves. And that's just the start of their evolutionary journey. Let's travel back in time, 250 million years ago, and witness the history of dinosaurs in 10 minutes. Triassic period. As you enter this new era, you'll notice that the dinosaurs running around look pretty different from what you're used to seeing. One of the earliest dinosaurs that emerged from the archosaurs was the Eoraptor. This little guy was about the size of a dog, barely one meter tall and weighing in at a meager 10 kilograms. You know, we typically think of dinosaurs as these massive creatures, but it'd be a couple million more years before that started to happen. We'll check in to see how those dinos are growing in size as we travel through time. But for now, let's see what's happening to Earth. During the Triassic period, the supercontinent Pangaea starts to fragment, slowly altering global climates and ecosystems. The climate was generally hot and dry, and there were no polar ice caps, creating a stark contrast to what you're typically used to in modern-day Earth. The vegetation was also very different and was crucial for the survival and evolution of dinosaurs. The plants have different characteristics as well. Some are tough, some nutritious, and others potentially poisonous. Each one of them will influence the dietary and adaptive strategies of different dinosaur species. Speaking of which, what are some other dinosaurs doing during this time? Weighing in at about 23 kilograms and one meter tall, we have the Coelophysis. It was a little bit bigger than the Eoraptor, but that didn't stop it from being a fast and agile predator that likely preyed on smaller animals. Now, the Herrerasaurus was slightly taller at about 1.1 meters, but was a lot heavier at about 350 kilograms. Then we have the Platyosaurus. Now, this guy is way bigger than me. It stood tall at about three meters and weighed up to 4,000 kilograms. This was one of the earliest examples of how big dinosaurs could grow. But wait, they get even bigger than this. Despite their impressive forms, dinosaurs weren't the dominant creatures during the Triassic. They had to share their environments with many other organisms, all vying for survival in the diverse ecosystems. This was the case until the Triassic period would experience a great extinction event. This was likely caused by massive volcanic activity, climate change, and potentially even some small asteroid impacts. This will have a significant effect on life on Earth and lead to the extinction of numerous species. But it wasn't all bad, especially for our dinosaurs. This moment set the stage to bring new opportunities to these species, leading to them dominating the Earth. Jurassic period. Now, instead of dinosaurs simply surviving, this is where they thrive. Over the millions of years, different species have been evolving, and dinosaurs are now the rulers of the Earth. They spread across continents, dominating the lush forests and arid deserts. Occupying these areas were some massive dinosaurs, ones that you're probably a lot more familiar with. We have the Stegosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and Allosaurus. These were some of the largest creatures ever to walk the Earth. But you'd quickly notice that it wasn't just these massive beasts that were roaming around. This era also saw the evolution of theropods. These were smaller dinosaurs that had more of a bird-like form. One of the most famous was the Archaeopteryx. It was kind of like a mix between a dinosaur and a bird with feathers and wings, but also with bony teeth and a tail. The Archaeopteryx was a crucial link between birds and dinosaurs. If you wait about 100 million more years, they'll evolve into the birds we know today. Oh, wait, is that a spoiler? After 56 million years, the Jurassic period comes to an end. This was after yet another extinction event happened. Luckily, this one is more minor. However, due to climate change, volcanic activity, and sea levels changing, some species are going extinct. This once again changes the landscape as the dinosaurs enter their final era. 
Cretaceous period. Okay, we've now entered the Cretaceous period, and as we've been traveling through these millions of years, you may have noticed something's missing. Right, one of the dinosaur's biggest stars hasn't appeared yet. Say hello to the Tyrannosaurus Rex. The T-Rex was a massive beast. It was 3.7 meters tall and 12 meters long. Not only that, but it was a whopping nine tons. Equipped with a powerful jaw and incredibly sharp teeth, the T-Rex dominated the Cretaceous Kingdom. It was one of the most dominant predators history has ever seen. This colossal beast wasn't just scavenging leftovers, it was an active hunter, stalking its prey with keen eyesight and a heightened sense of smell. Among its favorite meals were the sizable herbivores like the Edmontosaurus. But the T-Rex didn't stop there. It would take on formidable opponents like the Triceratops and even other smaller theropods if the opportunity arose. With its powerful jaws filled with 12-inch teeth and its strong hind limbs that allowed it to run at speeds of up to 40 kilometers per hour, the T-Rex was a master of the hunt. But this period wasn't just filled with massive beasts like the T-Rex. Look around and you'll also notice even more feathered dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period. One of them being the Velociraptor. Now, you typically see them portrayed like this with no feathers, but evidence suggests that these creatures were quite feathered. Now, the feathers weren't necessarily used for flying, more for warmth and stability. And this one is the Microraptor. Now, unlike the Velociraptor, its feathers likely were used for flight, giving us crucial insight into the evolution of birds. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, Pangaea was breaking up and forming into the continents we know today. But because of this, some dinosaurs were forced to migrate and separate into different areas of the world. These dinosaurs had to adapt to their new environments, potentially changing the course of their evolution. But none of this matters when we consider what happens next. The Cataclysmic Event Okay, as you've been hanging out with the dinosaurs for millions of years, an asteroid has been making its way toward Earth. Then suddenly, it hits, creating a massive crater 150 kilometers wide and 20 kilometers deep. Naturally, something this huge makes a devastating impact on the world, one that'll change it forever. The asteroid's collision is massive, but its impact is felt long after the initial crash. Due to the massive collision, the environment drastically changes. Significant drops in temperature start to occur, and debris from the crash begins to block out the sun. This impacts not only the dinosaurs' health, but also their food supply. This devastating event wipes out 75% of the Earth's species, many of which are the dinosaurs we've been observing this whole time. But don't worry, not all of the dinosaurs went extinct. The aviation-based dinosaurs we checked out earlier managed to survive the asteroid strike, eventually evolving into birds. Aftermath. Now that most of the dinosaurs are extinct, it's cleared the way for mammals to diversify and expand their impact on the world. With less competition, early mammals can now thrive and take over, which slowly, over time, allowed humans to evolve, building the world we know today. Dinosaurs went on to evolve for another 165 million years, but there's still so much we need to learn about them. Like, did you know that not all dinosaurs were cold-blooded? Some of them may have been warm-blooded, or even both. But that's a story for another What If. The Megalodon, the big boss of our ancient oceans. The king of all sharks, killer of whales. If you're a fan, you've already witnessed our Megalodon versus Mosasaur episode, but how would it fare?